Hello, saints. Peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Hope everyone is having a fantastic day today. In our last study, Acts chapter 17, after Paul and Silas are released from prison in Philippi, they go to Lydia's house. They say their goodbyes to Lydia and all the brothers and sisters that are there, and they head over to the other side of the peninsula to a city called Thessalonica. Now, Paul finds a synagogue called the House of Jason, and he preaches from the Scriptures, trying to reason with the Jews and convince them that their prophesied Messiah has come, and his name was Jesus. And he died, and he was buried, and he rose again. The Jews hate Paul for preaching this message, and they gather up a gang of lower base people. In other words, the Jews gathered up a bunch of criminals to attack Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They escape these criminals, and they make their way over to a city called Berea. And we read how the Bereans were of a more noble character. After Paul reasoned with them in the synagogues, the Bereans searched out the scriptures to see if Paul's message was indeed true. In other words, the Bereans were people who rightly divided. They rightly divided God's truth, and they benefited greatly from it. After the Bereans studied the scriptures, they found that what Paul was preaching was indeed true. It was facts. And many of the Bereans, Greek men and women, Gentiles, were added to the body of Christ. The Jews, meanwhile, back in Thessalonica, heard that Paul was preaching in Berea. And many were believing Paul and getting saved. They were added to the body of Christ. And this frustrated the Jews in Thessalonica so much that they traveled all the way to Berea to capture Paul. Most likely to try to kill Paul and Silas and Timothy and whoever else was with them. Paul escapes Berea and he heads down to Athens where he makes his famous Arapagus speech. And many of the Athenians were also added to the body of Christ. We also saw how the Greeks were worshiping all kinds of idols. The city was polluted with false teaching and debauchery, paganism, all kinds of sinful lusts were taking place in Athens, Greece. And this is in the region of uh, Achaia. So that brings us to chapter 18 of our study. And looking at the map, Paul is in Athens and he's about to travel west over to the city of Corinth. And the year is very late, 51 AD to early 52 AD. And also, let me remind you, now that we're over halfway through our study in the book of Acts, let me remind you what the purpose is of this study. It's to establish a foundation of right division. We've been seeing a transition taking place from the kingdom gospel preached to by Jesus and John the Baptist and the twelve kingdom apostles. We're seeing this transition from prophecy to mystery, from kingdom to grace. The book of Acts is very important. It lays that foundation for us. The transition of two Gospels, one for the Jews only, which leads them straight into Daniel's 70th week, the day of the Lord, and another one for both Jews and Gentiles that will stretch over a period of 2,000 years and will be exempt from Daniel's 70th week and from great tribulation. Looking at Colossians 1.26, it says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Of course, Paul wrote this again in Colossians 1.27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ephesians 3.3, 3, How that by revelation he made known unto me, Paul, the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Ephesians 3, 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from, beginning, from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So, Daniel's 70th week 
will not be about salvation by faith alone. A lot of people ask me if there's a second chance after the rapture. Well, you have to understand that salvation will not be by faith alone during Daniel's 70th week. It's going to be about enduring till the end by faith plus works. They need to have proof of their faith, which is the fruit that they're going to need at the second coming when they call on the name of the Lord. So, as we continue our study, keep this transition in mind. As we answer the questions of right division, who's speaking, who's being spoken to, what dispensation are we dealing with, and so on. So, chapter 18 and verse 1, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Now, Corinth is a port city. If you remember from a previous study that we did, another video on Romans 10, this city of Corinth is filled with crime, idol worship, prostitution, theft, murders. It's a major hub of commerce. If you took Las Vegas, if anybody watching this video is familiar with Las Vegas, if you've ever been there, it's called the Sin City. Well, if you took Las Vegas and you made it a port city, let's say on the East Coast, right next to or above New York City, you'd have the city of Corinth. In verse 2, And found a, a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. Now, there was a major persecution taking place in Rome during this period of time. Many of the Jews fled Rome to find safety. And here we have husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla. They fled to the city of Corinth. Verse 3, And because he was of the same craft, or occupation, he abode with them, and wrought. For by their occupation they were tent makers. Now the word wrought here means to work. Paul made tents to make a living, to, to make some money to support his missionary journeys, his ministry. In verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks, Gentiles. And when Silas and Timotheus were come to from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit, and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Again, we see Paul reasoning with both the Jews and Gentiles, but first of all, to the Jews. Remember, Paul's method of reasoning was to show the Jews from the Old Testament scriptures that prophecy pointed directly to Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. And once Paul did that, then he moved on to explain that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected back to life. The gospel, our gospel. This is part of the mystery revealed to Paul in Damascus and Arabia. And also, Paul would reveal this mystery gospel as having not the need to follow the Mosaic law system, which the Jews just couldn't understand that concept. And this got Paul in trouble in many cases. But the Gentiles were more apt to understand the gospel. And as a result, huge masses of Gentiles were being saved and added to the body of Christ. They're making the Jews more and more jealous. They're seeing all these Gentiles believing in their God. And we know this was part of Paul's strategy. Jealousy. And the scripture tells us it's also God's strategy bringing the Jews to jealousy by reaching out and saving the Gentiles. We see that in Romans 11.11. 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. For to provoke them to jealousy. So we see that jealousy was a tactic being used, not only by Paul, but also God, to save Israel. In verse 6, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment, Paul shook his raiment, and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And this made the Jews even more jealous. So Paul leaves immediately to avoid being killed, obviously. And one thing about verse 6. This verse is often taken out of context. 
And those who don't rightly divide, they use verse 6 to say that Paul was only going to the Jews first and ignored the Gentiles till the end of his ministry. Well, if you've been following this study, you know that since chapter 13, Paul's method of operation, if you will, is always to find the synagogues, then he'd reason with the Jews, and there was always Gentiles present who would accept Paul's gospel, and they would be saved and added to the body of Christ. So Paul's been preaching the gospel of grace to both Jews and Gentiles from the very start of his ministry, all the way back from Damascus and Jerusalem and Tarsus, especially Tarsus, because it was Roman Gentiles. And what verse 6 is saying is Paul first, first of all, wants to bring the Jews to jealousy. And he said he no longer go to the synagogues to find them or to help them. But instead, he'd go straight to the Gentiles, which will make the Jews even more jealous. This is all part of Paul's plan to save Israel. So now the Jews are very angry, very jealous, and Paul has to depart quickly before they kill him so he goes to the Gentiles alone, right? Verse 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Jesus comes to Paul and speaks to him. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And he, Paul, continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now, while Paul's here in the city of Corinth for a year and in six months he's going to write the books of Thessalonians and Galatians so now would be a good time for you to read those books Thessalonians Galatians to see exactly what Paul's been teaching during this time in his ministry you'll see that Paul taught the harpazo the rapture during this time among many other things in verse 12 and when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. Again, the Jews just couldn't deal with the lawless gospel. They hated Paul because he was teaching the gospel of grace, salvation without the law, salvation by belief alone. And the Jews couldn't deal with Paul's gospel. Remember, the Jews are made blind supernaturally because they rejected their Messiah. They're being punished, and they can't comprehend salvation without works. Verse 14, And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names, and of your law, Look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus, and looked them there, but he himself entered into the synagogues, and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea, he gone up and saluted the church. He went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Now, looking at our map, Paul leaves Corinth. He heads down to Centria, having shorn, making a vow. He leaves Centria, sails to Ephesus. 
Paul preaches in the Ephesian synagogues quickly. Then he leaves Priscilla and Aquila behind and he sails from Ephesus all the way down to Caesarea. He fulfills his vow. Then he heads up to Antioch. Then some time later, he heads north on foot through Galatia, Phrygia, to visit the body of Christ that he'd established years earlier. Now, if you want to get a good sense of what Paul had to deal with on this journey through Galatia and Phrygia, read Galatians. The assemblies, the body of Christ, was being bombarded by the law-minded Jews, tricking them back under the bondage of the Mosaic law system. Look at Galatians 3 real, real quick. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Here therefore, he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham? And Paul continues on in Galatians 3, pleading with them to turn from the bondage of the law, and to be free by salvation without the law. Salvation by faith alone in Christ Jesus. Every time I read Galatians, I can't help but think about a certain movement taking place today. I see Gentiles acting like they're Jewish, growing beards, wearing funny hats and clothes, calling Jesus another name, worshiping on the Sabbath, following the feast days, adhering to the same system of laws that Paul's talking about here in Galatians. They're doing the same, this very same thing that Paul rebukes the body of Christ for at Galatia. The Jews are convincing the Gentiles in Galatia to follow the law in order to keep their salvation. And this certain movement today calls Paul a false prophet and they ignore 13 books out of the Bible. And make no mistake about it, friends, the people in this movement are headed straight into Daniel's 70th week. And they're going to fall for the, de the deception by the Antichrist because God will allow them to be deceived. They'll have to endure until the end. And they're not going to make it to the end because Daniel's week is for his people, the Jews. Saints, don't be fooled. The enemy is working just as hard today as he was 2,000 years ago. So have discernment, guard yourselves with the shield of faith, faith in Christ Jesus alone for salvation by belief alone, without works, without the law. The very same thing Paul writes to the Galatians about. If someone tells you in order to be saved, you have to have faith plus works, faith plus this, place faith plus that, run. Run as fast as you can, because those people are the Galatians of today. In Romans 3.28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by what? Faith, without the deeds of the law. That can't be any more clearer. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, without the deeds of the law. We see Paul pleading with them here that salvation is not by works or the law, but is by faith alone without the law. This is exactly what Paul was dealing with during that time. That's why right division of God's truth is so very important. Important enough that Paul stresses to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So now we turn back to Acts 18. The scene 
turns over to Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, teaching the Ephesians the gospel of grace. Verse 24, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This is where they are, Priscilla and Aquila. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John, water baptism. And he began to speak boldly in a synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, they basically they took him aside and expounded unto him, they explained unto him something, something important, the way of God more perfectly. So Apollos only knows about John's water baptism. So Priscilla and Aquila take him aside and they teach him all about the Holy Spirit baptism, a more perfect way. They explain to him the difference between John's baptism and the Holy Spirit baptism. Remember what the reason was for John's water baptism. It was for the remission of sins, which is temporary. And they did not receive the Holy Ghost when they were water baptized. Also, John's baptism was to distinguish believing Jews from non-believing Jews in the gospel of the kingdom, believing in Jesus as the Messiah or not believing in him as the Messiah. Baptism by the Holy Ghost is permanent. You are sealed unto salvation. Two very different types of baptism for two very different reasons in two different dispensations. One is temporary and the other is permanent, sealing you in the body of Christ. And we're going to get into that in chapter 19. In verse 27, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by scriptures, that Jesus was Christ. Now in closing to review, we saw how Paul left Corinth, went to Ephesus, went down to take care of his vow that he had made, he had shorn his head. And we also saw Gallio and Paul meeting each other. Paul returns to Antioch and he heads north on foot to Galatia through Phry Phrygia, saying hi to all the previous members of the body of Christ that were established on his earlier journeys. And we saw Apollos in Ephesus. He was preaching only the water baptism. And we saw Priscilla and Aquila taking Apollos to the side and explaining to him that there was a Holy Spirit baptism. One is for the remission of sins, which is temporary. The other is a sealing that is permanent. Two very different baptisms which will be further explained in chapter 19. So that's it for chapter 18. Peace, grace, love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you on the next study of Acts chapter 19.